speaking up, so are you up first? I'm up first. Awesome. I will hand it over to the one and the only Tom. appreciate you guys weathering the storm out there and coming and hope you enjoy the presentation. I kind of do a uh, history of mining in the state of California and I use some mining antiques as training aids and the Retired Teachers Association thought it was pretty cool so we'll do it again. James Marshall discovered gold in Coloma Valley, American River in 1848, January 24th to be exact. He was building a sawmill for a man named John Sutter. And he was out one morning and he was in the bottom of the mill race checking it out. And he decided that the mill race wasn't deep enough. But at the same time that he noticed that, he saw these little sparkly things in the water. So he reached down, he picked one up, and by God, it was a nugget. And he started looking around and he started picking them up all over the place. The mistake he made was telling somebody. <laughs> well, the word got out, and the gold rush of 1849 started. Now, it took that long because communications back in those days were non-existent. And they came from the East Coast, they came from China, they came from Canada, Mexico. And they started gobbling up gold all over the place. At first, they could just pick it up off the ground in some areas. That's how much there was, but then they started using uh, pans, gold pans, something similar to this one. This is a segmented pan from the 1840s. And they started panning for gold in the streams. Well, that's a kind of slow operation. You know, you don't find too much gold taking a lot of dirt and panning it. And so they went to, I don't know if you can all see this, this is, there's a picture in that handout you got. This is a, that's a this is a, a called a cradle or a rocker. Now the reason they call it a cradle is because it looks like a baby's cradle. And what they would do is dump material in the top of this, and then they get a scoop full of water, and they rock this back and forth at the same time pouring water. The heavy stuff would stay up here. They'd check it to see what was in there, rocks or whatever, dump the rocks. The gold would end up in this ripple tray in the bottom. Well. This was kind of a slow operation, too. It was a one-man deal. And uh, they decided they were going to make these, what they call, long tarms. That's in your next picture, I believe. What it is is it's just a long sluice, and it has ripples in it. And this is a dry washer, but it's got ripples, too. You picture, a, picture a long trough about a foot wide and a foot high, with little pieces of wood attached to the bottom of it. And as they threw the material in and the water traveled down this, the heavy gold would stay behind these riffles. And after a period of time, they divert the water and then check behind the riffles and see what they had. Now, some of these long toms were 2,000 feet long. And they didn't just throw dirt in in the beginning. I mean, there was guys all along in the stream dumping material into this thing. Because they figured if they get together as a group, they'd find more gold and then they'd share. Well, the next thing they decided after that was to use the monitor, hydraulic mining. That's your next picture, I think. They're switched. They're switched, okay. I'm supposed to be looking at, you know. Yeah, that's your problem. Yeah. Anyway, the hydraulic mining, that's where they would take this monitor. They had flumes from the mountaintops, and they flumes would travel miles with the water traveling through it, building up momentum at miles per hour, and then it would come out that monitor, and they just hose the mountainside, and all of this material would come off. Well, if they did this for a number of years until the state of California said, that's enough. You're destroying the rivers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they stopped doing it. Well, the next thing, after 
all this placer mining, and that's what it's called, is placer mining, because it's gold in place. It's not where it came from, it's there. So they decided, let's find out where it came from, because gold was starting to be harder to find. So they decided to go up the streams and look at the mountains and see what the heck was coming on. Well, they started climbing these mountains, and they saw quartz veins, etc., and they started chipping away, and, hey, there's gold in this stuff. A new way of finding gold, load mining or hard rock mining, and that's when they started tunneling into the sides of the hills to get the gold. Well, back in those days, they didn't have any electricity, so when they went into these mines, the first thing they decided to use was a candle. And that was their illumination. And they said, you ever been in a, in a room with all the lights are out at night and there's no lights outside? You know, when the power goes off and you can't see your hand in front of your face? That's what these mine shafts look like. So they would put these candles and they'd stick them in the side of the, of the tunnel and that was the only light they were using. Well, you're in this tunnel the only light you have is a candle, and you're supposed to be using this chisel, and a, this is a single jack, because it's only for one man, and you're punching holes in the side of the wall so that you can set dynamite. Well, that's a single jack. This is a double jack. This is an eight-pound sledgehammer, and they call it a double jack because it takes two guys to do it. One guy standing there twisting this chisel, drilling a hole, and his good friend <laughs> is, is operating the, the double jack. Well, they had, a, they had a deal. If he missed and hit him, then they switched places. So they, were, they made sure that they were uh, careful. And also, at the same time, as they drilled the hole, the material that they were drilling would end up staying in the hole. So they used what's called a miner spoon. And what they do is put this in a hole, spin it around, and pull the debris out until they had the hole deep enough to uh, set the dynamite. They usually had a, their own blacksmith on site because these miner spoons weren't, it wasn't something you could commercially buy. They made them on site. And they repaired the drills and everything else. Well, Getting back to the lights for a second, after the candle, somebody come along and said, you know, <coughs> an oil lamp would work real good and give us a little more light and probably last a little longer than the candle. And they just take the, put it in their hat and walk around with their oil lamp. The only trouble with the oil lamp is it was pretty dangerous. <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't know if this is any better. This is a carbide lamp. That came next. Well, carbide, when you add water to it and you light it with a, there's a flint in there, it shoots out a flame. Well, carbide and water create uh, acetylene gas. So, I don't know which one was the better, the oil or the acetylene. But it gave off more light, and that they were happy with that. The next came Thomas Edison. Good old Tom. This is a electric, battery-operated, back in those days, rechargeable. And they would put this on the hat. And ever since I've gotten this, I haven't figured out how to open it. <laughs> it's heavy enough to have a battery in it. Nowadays, they run electric lines down the tunnels, and they got 110, and they got electric lights, etc. So that's no problem. Okay, so we drill the hole. Then what we do is we, we, we put dynamite in it. It's just a piece of PVC. <laughs> but they would they would take a take a, a uh, a blasting cap, they push it into the end of the, of the dynamite, and then they'd set the dynamite down inside that hole. Well, after they set the dynamite in the hole, they would use a 
tamping bag, and they had plenty of these paper bags that come in different diameters. And what you do is you fill this up with dirt and then slide it into the hole in front of the in back of the dynamite. And this keeps the blast in the rock and not coming out through the hole. They also, when they were panning back in the old days, they would use copper pans also. And when they used the copper pan, the reason they used copper is they'd coat it with mercury and then pan for the gold. And the only thing that would stick to the mercury is the gold. And then when the mercury became the consistency of peanut butter, they take it out of the pan and they put it in a wet chamois cloth. And they, they take the chamois and form it into a bag and they start wrapping string or rope around it to cause it to get smaller and smaller and squeeze the mercury out of the chamois. And then what they would do is they, then they'd open it up and there'd still be some mercury on the gold in there. So they'd take a spoon or something, take this thing, and just hold it over a stove or a fire or something and breathe in all that mercury and, you know. But the mercury would vent off and then they'd have just gold. I don't think these guys live very long. Uh, the next picture that's there is the picture of a mill on the side of a hill. Now, the way they, this is after they, they've gotten the gold out of, or the ore out of the tunnel, and they're going to run it to the mill. So they can take it to the mill. The mill was built on the side of a hill because they were using gravity to feed the gold into the mill. They pour, the, pour this uh, ore into the top of the mill. It had come down. They mix it with water. The next page, it shows you these stamps. The stamp is nothing more than a vertical hammer. And they, they grind up this ore till it became a powdery slurry. And if you look at the, the below the, the stamps, they look like plates coming out. Well, those plates are copper plates covered with mercury. <clears throat> and, the, and the slurry would come over these plates, and when the mercury got real thick, they divert the water to another plate. And then in the next picture, you see these two guys squeegeeing off the mercury. And back in those days, they didn't know what the, what the ramifications were breathing in this mercury. They squeegee you off the mercury, and they, they put it in a retort. And this is a, re a small version of a retort. You put the, they call it an amalgam when it's mercury and gold together. And they put the amalgam in the, in the retort, tighten it down real tight, and they set it in a fire. Well, we all know that mercury turns into a gas when we heat it, right? So the, the mercury will, gas mercury will travel down the tube. As it travels down the tube, it cools off again. They have a container here with water in it. And that container will capture the mercury so they can reuse it again. And theoretically, when it's, <clears throat> the mercury stops flowing, the only thing left in here is the gold. So that's how they would get the gold out of the, out of the mercury in the, on a large scale. This, this item here is a mercury flask that holds 76 pounds of mercury when it's full. <clears throat> now, they, they also had to test the gold or the, the ore to make sure there was gold in it. Because, let's face it, mining is, is not a hobby. It's, a, it's a, a business. They open mines, find the gold, sell the gold, pay their employees. <clears throat> so what they do is they use screens. First they grind it up, test it, some mortar and pestle, grind it up, or they take some and they run it through the screens. These screens are graduated from large to small. <coughs> and then they would <coughs> test, test each one to check the seed. Am I make, going to make enough money operating this operation? Is there enough gold in this stuff that's going to pay me in the end? Like when we do, we 
we, 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 we have a joke about our hobby out here, and that's what it is, is a hobby, is don't quit your day job. So. But these guys were, were doing it for money. So they, they, they grind it up and they put it in a, a crucible, they add chemicals, they fire it in a kiln, the chemicals would draw off everything except the material that they're looking for, either gold or silver or whatever, and let it cool off, break it, get rid of the, the chemicals that are hardened, and then whatever's left hopefully is gold or silver if that's what they were going for. Some of the other items that I have here, they always had to eat. So there's a, this is a lunch pail, right? And it's got a little tray inside. Canteen. This ingot mold over here, I had to bring it because even though it weighs, must weigh 100 pounds. If you, if you fill that full of gold, it holds 1,692 ounces of gold. 1,692, or 141 pounds, which at today's prices is $2.791 million. <clears throat> yeah, too bad it's empty, empty huh? <laughs> this is a small ingot mold, and uh, Charlie's got one. We picked this up in Austin. This this was in a silver mining town. This item here is called a safety lamp. They didn't have these in the beginning, but they would set light this and set it and have a mirror on it too. So they could set it way down the end of the tunnel and they could be up on the other end and they could still see the flame. And it's baffled in such a way that even if the gas in the tunnel is uh, explosive, it won't set off the explosive gas. And they set the flame for a certain height, and then if they keep an eye on it, and they make sure that the flame doesn't change in intensity one way or the other, or it doesn't change color. And if it does any of those things, they beat feet out of there because there's something wrong with the air. <laughs> it saved the canary. <laughs> this, this also saved the canary. This is called an anemometer, and it measures the airflow. It's got a dial on it so you can read it. <clears throat> Another little instrument they had. This is called a dip needle. It's nothing more than a compass that's hanging on edge. And what they would do, you have to, one of the secrets is this, you got to walk north and south. <laughs> <laughs> That's straight scoop. <laughs> And they would walk along with this thing and watch the needle. And if there was a large amount of iron in the soil, an outcrop or whatever, they would flag it or mark it somehow and keep going. And when they were done doing a, an area, they would check to see where all these little flags were. Because they found out that normally gold is associated with iron. So if they were looking for the gold, iron's not magnetic, so they have to look for the, I mean, gold isn't magnetic, so they have to look for the iron. And the old timers, when they went to the store in town to buy supplies, they went to the store and the storekeeper had one of these balance scales, either that size or a little bigger. But they never trusted the <coughs> storekeeper, I don't know why, but the storekeepers had a, had a habit of drilling the bottom of the weights and adding lead to them so that the, the weight was heavier than it was supposed to be. So they used to carry their own little scales around to make sure they weren't getting cheated. In the blasting of the dynamite, we also use the... You've seen those in the old cowboy movies, huh? Okay. Well, working in these mines and stuff, usually there was a mine owner. And after a while, he started realizing that all this gold that they were mining, he wasn't getting it all. He says, hmm, we got high graders in here. 
So they come up with a system. This is, this is the system. There's two baskets here with uh, pulleys, and they would anchor the pulleys to the top of the tunnel. And the guys would come into work in the morning, and they'd have to strip down, put their clothes in there, and put on their mining clothes that the miner, the mine owner had available for them. And then they'd run these baskets up to the ceiling, and the grappling hooks, they had a rail, and the grappling hook would fit under the rail, and they'd lock the rail so they couldn't bring these baskets back down until the shift was over, and eliminated a whole bunch of hydrating. Really, really inventive, I'll tell you. Let's see, what else have we got? I got more junk. You ought to see what I got at home. Looks like it is. Another, another type of weight was they're nested, they fit inside each other. And this, this beast here is called a dry washer. Oh, I don't know how many people ever heard of Dowie Crittenden. He lived in 29 Palms after the uh, Second World War. He was an electrical engineer down in L.A. He retired and come up here and got interested in prospecting. And he started, hey, I think he made more money on dry washers than he did finding gold, but I'm, I can't prove that. Because he made over 300 of these things. And he sold them. But he used to backpack this thing to wherever he's going. He had a two-wheel drive vehicle. He'd go out in the Dale District, park his car. He had straps on it, put it on his back. He had two little clips on the front of his suspenders that, that straps for this thing. That's where he hung his bucket. And in his bucket, he had water and his lunch and some small tools and a, a whisk broom. And then through, through this side, into the... Uh, in through here, and through the bottom of the dry washer, he had a hoe, and on this side he had a shovel, and off he'd go. And he'd spend all day out there just moving dirt and, and hand cranking, not like we do today, we got motorized. But he's out there just hand cranking away. But he was ingenious. You'd see him in town, he'd be in the, going through the dumpsters. And you'd think, oh man, this guy, what's he doing going through the, well, he's not going through the dumpsters for food, he's looking for parts to make more dry washers. <laughs> And the guy was amazing. He didn't buy a pulley. He made them. He made the pulleys. He, everything on here he made from scratch. And he was ingenious, too. The cans at the bottom on the bottom pulley are counterweights to, to uh, offset the bellows operation of the dry washer. They smoothed out the, the operation. Well, he made them so that they could be opened up. So when he went and carrying this thing, they were empty. And then when he got where he was going, he filled them full of dirt to give the weight and close them up. And voila, he had a counterweight. The guy was amazing. The way this thing operates is that uh, you have a, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. In the bottom, there's a bellows. It goes up and down. The little little valves there allow air to come in and then close when you want to push the air up through the through the ripple tray. And the ripple tray is nothing more than a cloth with a screen supporting the cloth. And there's ripples. Well, I don't know if you, you can't see it. But the, the, right behind each ripple there's a, a dead space. And that's what this these pieces of wood here do. So that when you're you're operating this thing, air comes up through this cloth, takes the light material and causes it to go down and off. Heavy material, because of the dead space, my time is up. <laughs> because of the dead space, the heavy material stays behind the riffle. So you put a couple of hundred shovelfuls of dirt into this thing, cranking and killing yourself, and then you empty the tray, and that's what you pan to see if there's any gold. So it's a, a labor of love. Okay. When, when we're done here, you guys can come up and look and see and touch. And even got a gold display here of local gold. And uh, 
ask questions. Okay? Yes. Why don't you mention the sluice was where they had water and the dry washer was down there in the desert? They did. That was a long time. I know, but just to explain. The he didn't have one to bring in. I don't have one. I know. You got a picture of one. The long tom used the water, the dry water uses air. The only difference, the principle is the same. Did he ever patent that? Did he patent it? Yeah. No, because it, it was there's all sorts of different problem. models of the things. Yeah. yeah. Australia had a real beaut. I've been trying to get plans to, because it it not only puffed like this, it rocked back and forth, and I, you know, and I'm a nut for mechanical stuff. So, yes, ma'am. How, how successful were they? Were they in the desert getting gold um, out of the mines and? Back in the old days? Yeah, in the old days. Well, Jimmy's going to cover that oh, because good. he's going to cover the Dale and the supply mine and tell you how much was taken out of there. Good. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, mercury. It sounded like they had to use a lot of mercury. Where'd they get the mercury? All that, all that mercury from? Mined it. They mined mercury off the mercury. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. cinnabar. There's a mine for mercury in San Diego. That's where most of it came from. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, they don't use the mercury, they use cyanide. That's another <laughs> safe. <laughs> and the, the cyanide, they, 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 they've got two ways of doing it. Up in Randsburg, they've got a huge pile of material, and they heat leach. they got, they got these heavy plastic material underneath the pile, and they, they drip this cyanide solution through, and it puts the, puts the gold in solution. And then they recapture the cyanide and they put it in a in a vat with uh, zinc plates and they apply uh, electricity to the plates and it draws the gold out of the cyanide. That ain't mine. Oh, I am so sorry. I didn't know I had my phone on. Cindy, shame. I didn't even know I had it. Cindy, oh. Cyanide in in, in, in uh, tanks to uh, to take the gold out of solution. Yeah, John. Sometime in the future, maybe 30 years from now, will this collection be together? And if so, where will it be? Uh, 30 years from now, I'll still be here. <laughs> 40 years from now. <laughs> it, it's 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 destined for the Mackey School of Mines in Reno. Yeah.